yeah welcome everybody this is session number 14 of our decolonial reading group today we will be talking about the decolonization in the context of the ethiopian revolution marxism in an african context and how african studies and critical theory could be thought together in decolonial ways um our reading material for this discussion was eleni santin zilica's book um, Ethiopia and Theory, Revolution and Knowledge Production from 1964 to 2016, which was published last year by Brill Editorial in Leiden, Leiden and Boston, while a paperback version was published at Haymarket Books. Professor Zelika herself is um, joining us from New York today. <laughs> um, and let me quickly introduce you and then we can start. Um, professor Eleni Santim Zelike is assistant professor at, of African Studies at MESAS, the Department of Middle Eastern, South Asian, and African Studies at Columbia University, New York. Before that, she was at Whitman College in Washington State, as well as in Toronto at the Graduate Program in Social and Political Thought at York, York University, where she received her PhD in 2016. Her research interests include student movements in the Horn of Africa, 20th century state formation in Africa, as well as comparative social and political theory. Santim teaches not only these topics, but also African political thought, critical theory, and histories of capitalism. Among other journals, her work has appeared in the Journal of Northeast African Studies and Kalalu, a journal of African diaspora arts and letters. And some of the main questions that her book, Ethiopian Theory, deals with, and that we will probably also be tackling today, are what does it mean to write about the appropriation and indigenization of Marxist in mainstream social science ideas in an Ethiopian and African context? And what does the archive of revolutionary thought in Africa teaches us about the practice of critical theory more generally. Santim, um, let me just say it really is a huge honor and pleasure for us to have you joining us today, despite Zoom fatigue and um, spring weather. <laughs> <laughs> we are really extremely grateful for your time, especially as until now, we have mostly been focusing on decoloniality in a Southern and Central American context. So, and also in a literary context, so the topics you are bringing into our discussion were probably um, new to some of us. However, I think uh, that the questions you are raising are very crucial to knowledge production and the academic discourse in general. So welcome, Santim. Thank you so much for being here. Right. Thank you for having me. Uh, since it's a you know, not a webinar and, and we're all just on Zoom. I wonder if it's possible to see more faces. It's so weird talking into like um, a blank sort of screen. If anybody wants to turn their camera on, <laughs> I'd love to see you. It makes life much better. Um, all right. So, um, hi everybody. Thank you for coming. Great. Um, so, I mean, I, I suppose many of you have already read something of, of my book, if not, if not everything of the book. So I am wondering if the best place to start wouldn't be um, with a set of questions from you. I'm also tired of sort of talking at people um, <laughs> because I've been talking at people on Zoom for the past year. So I was thinking, um, that one of the ways to begin would just be with questions um, rather than me sort of, you know, prefacing, um, you know, my book. Um, so I don't know if people want to begin that way. Um, uh, what else? I mean, I could say things about my book, but I, I, I think I would just rather you ask questions and then we just have a conversation. Is that okay? I mean, I'm assuming people have read the, the readings um yeah if, or if not maybe people have seen the video you know right so, so right. I was like also actually grateful for that because you don't have to repeat yourself and I thought it was a really nice way to to um get to know your work as well 
And right. then I have like, like at least seven questions. So. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> okay. But like, yeah, maybe I ask the first question and then people will probably join into the discussion if that's all right. Um, sure. Sure. Or just to like get us back into the topic because I know some people like come out of a different context and then have to like remember what this is actually about. Um, I thought that maybe we could like start with a very, um, yeah, with like with like one of your central points, even though we haven't read the chapters about the actual Ethiopian revolution, but I think it would be interesting to ask you um um yeah just to like also get us on the same page about the historical events i wanted to ask if you think like i mean i don't think that this period of um an authoritarian emperor like Haile Selassie can be called a decolonial pro project in like in itself but in comparison to what came after like this whole pan african idea or the organization of African unity, um, you know, seems a little more decolonial than what happened then during the military uh, period or the like Soviet style period that happened um, starting in, in 1974. So um, yeah, in other words, like obviously maybe, and also we can connect this to the title of the session you know, the Ethiopian revolution was not an anti-colonial revolution. Um, but at the same time, I do think um, that colonial, colonialism does play a role. I mean, you say that in the book, obviously, colonialism plays a role um, in how we think about Africa or what we think we know about Africa. This whole like, this whole like, you know, objectification of the continent and fetishization. fetishization. Um, so yeah, so I ended up understanding your perspective on this specific revolution in relation also to um, Chisita as a very decolonial way of narrating the, you know, the Ethiopian historical context. And my question here would be like, would you say like I thought it was actually like really impressive how you did that and I, and would you say that each historical event needs its own decolonial method of reading it you know like if we understand Chisita as a method mm -hmm. um, of of research would you say that every that it only works for this specific historical context or can we like use it for other contexts as well Mm -hmm. Okay, there was a bunch of different questions you just asked me. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, I think you started off by asking me about Haile Selassie, right? And I don't know if people know who Haile Selassie is, but Haile Selassie was, um, uh, I guess he called himself a king and an emperor. Um, and he is um, considered a, uh, a kind of godlike figure within Rastafarian traditions. Um, but they've also appropriated him um, out of the Ethiopian context and made him make sense for a kind of black new world context um, without necessarily paying attention to the ways in which he is um, part of a larger historical process um, in Ethiopia and in the Horn of Africa. So obviously Ethiopia was one of the few countries in Africa to never be colonized, never to be formally colonized. Um, and he was seen as a leader um, in terms of that process through which Ethiopia was never colonized. And I think the Rastafarian movement looks up to him as a leader of a kind of sovereign black nation. Um, within Ethiopia, his, 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 his role is, is much more contested. Um, and so it is interesting because some people do um, write about Haile Selassie as an anti-colonial figure because sovereignty in Ethiopia was maintained or, I mean, part of what I argue though in my book is that it's it's difficult to think of Haile Selassie just as an anti-colonial figure. 
um, because what happens in the late 19th century in Ethiopia is this kind of pressure to um, shape something like a nation state in, in the Horn of Africa. And I see Haile Selassie as somebody who is leading that process of reshaping uh, political entities um, in, in the Horn of Africa through uh, the European model of, of the nation state, right? And so what, what, you, what you end up having in Ethiopia is um, a, a, a kind of homogenization of geographic space um, and um, a sense that everybody is supposed to speak one language, which is Amharic, which is an indigenous, you know, African language, but not everybody speaks it. And there's, you know, over 80 languages in Ethiopia. So this idea that um, space is homogenized um, and, you know, you're speaking one language where one people, one territory, one language. And, and, I, and I think one has to theorize Haile Selassie as leading that process rather than thinking of him just as a kind of, you know, indigenous African, you know, leader who managed to maintain, um, you know, a kind of African polity in the context of, um, you know, the scramble for Africa. And in, in many ways, people see Haile Selassie as participating in the scramble for Africa, actually, or certainly his, um, his predecessor, um, who is known as Minalik. And when you listen to hip hop and when you listen to dance hall and reggae, you always find references to Minalik and to Haile Selassie, right? Minalik was the, the kind of king who led Ethiopia prior to Haile Selassie. Um, yeah, from the Fugees to like all kinds of like hip hop and reggae, there's references to, uh, to Minalik, right? But Minalik for many, indigenous populations in the Horn of Africa is actually seen as a conqueror, right? Um, who brought, brought them into the ambit of the Ethiopian nation state, right? And forced them to adopt Orthodox Christianity, Coptic Christianity, which is also indigenous to Ethiopia, but then get exported to other groups in the region and also forced them to speak Amharic and to become more Amharicized. So, I mean, the, Ethiopia is interesting in the ways in which indigenous institutions get reworked for the project of the nation state, right? And I think it tells us, it, it's an early lesson in the problems of the nation state, actually, and in the, and the problems of anti-colonial nationalism, right? Because I think many of the things that are happening in the early 20th century in Ethiopia are part of the problems of anti-colonial nationalism later on, right? So I would hesitate to talk about Haile Selassie as a kind of anti-colonial world maker. Although for instance, in Adom Gattacho's book, World Making After Empire, um, which is a book that looks at anti-colonial leaders. I don't know if people are familiar with that book. It's an important book that was published in 2019 as well. Um, she posits, you know, Haile Selassie as this kind of, you know, anti-colonial figure uh, alongside people like Nkrumah and Nereri and so on, right? Um, I, I, I really think that's a very problematic positing. <laughs> But she also is celebrating the kind of African anti-colonial nationalism as a world-making enterprise. And I think that's true to some degree. So she always, she makes the argument that even though the nation state became the form through which anti-colonialism was articulated, the vision of anti-colonial thinkers was always to change the world. It was never just to build, um, you, know, you know, kind of narrow nationalism. Um, and I do think that's true, but there's limitations to the nation state as a form that then restructures the relationships between people internal to that nation state. And I think in the context of Ethiopia, um, what Haile Selassie ends up doing is, you know, positing one group as, you know, in a sense, more, more superior than many of the other groups within that nation state um, context. So, um, the, the revolution in a way is a critique of that process, actually. The 1974, or certainly the, the student movement in the 60s and 70s is an attempt to grapple with 
the ways in which Ethiopia dealt with um, the scramble for Africa, right? And the ways in which um, political sovereignty was expressed in and through the scramble for Africa, right? Um, but the student movement feels that, you know, a lot of the problems that are that come out of that engagement with the scramble for Africa is really problematic. It, as I said, the fact that you have one nation, one language, one territory being posited um, becomes a really problematic thing. And so the, the two questions that are really important for the student movement in the 60s and 70s is how do we talk about other communal identities in Ethiopia that are not Amharic or Amhara and um, are not Coptic Christian, right? Um, so, you know, it's really difficult even today to talk about Islam in Ethiopia, right? The way in which people understand the nation state in Ethiopia is a Christian island amongst, you know, Muslims, <laughs> right? That is still like a dominant narrative that is told in Ethiopia and in many ways probably shapes the current war that's happening in Ethiopia right now, right? Um, so it's, yeah, it's complicated. So they're, 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 the, the student movement is trying to think about the, about communal identities um, and, and different language groups and how do, we, how do we assert the rights of those language groups um, within this kind of nation state context, but also then how land is connected to communal identities, how land is being appropriated by um, by by people who are modernizers, I would say, right? And and land is being, you know, from from the early twentieth century until nineteen seventy four, you have this process of land becoming more privatized and being moved out of these these sort of communal groups, right? So so the two sort of dominant questions for the student movement is the land question and what ends up being articulated as the nationalities question. When they meet, when they talk about the nationalities question, they're not talking about the nation state. They, inv they talk about communal identities in Ethiopia through the nationalities question. Um, so I think I've actually talked quite a lot. So I'm gonna stop there and uh, see what other questions. I, I mean, you had, you had the you had questions about Tizita, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I've been talking at you for a while, so let me stop talking for a bit, at least for a break. <laughs> yeah, um, that's totally fine. Thank you so much. I we can totally come back to the other question later. Um, what like if we if nobody else has a like burning question right now, I thought we could also maybe all say um, you could all like tell us a little bit what I, what you're interested in in this session you know just like tell us what you're here for like are you in, mostly interested in Ethiopia are you mostly interested in decolonial theory and like I don't know right. or Colombia I don't know like anything um I don't like for example um Anna Hankings Evans she's uh, another one of the um, guests she has given a guest um presentation in this group and um she's a lawyer so so like you're probably interested in other things you know like this, everybody this has like their own their own uh, perspective oh hannah anna hi hi how are you hi um thank you for um being here and uh teaching us or or, or giving us an insight into your work and um studies I'm a lawyer indeed, and I also deal with decolonization in Africa, but more from a theoretical point also with the concepts of sovereignty that you have mentioned, how the concept enabled um, colonization as such, imperialism, and then how, um, yeah, how it shaped today's world in like today's laws and, and understandings of certain concepts. But I find your insight very interesting because um, I've never, I mean, I've, my, my dad is from Ghana. So I've dealt a little bit about the um, struggle in Ghana. And it seems whenever you look at African countries, it almost replicates itself. So my question is, 
did decolonization fail or um, is it as such an imperfect movement because it has to be because otherwise you cannot move on towards liberation and anyways any liberation movement is an imperfect movement because you you always have an opposing side that will use arguments to deconstruct and it's often also battle so we also have this Nkrumah for example you know um, like a political leader that is celebrated everywhere else but in Ghana while you have a strong support group nevertheless there are also a lot of critics and rightfully so because there was a lot of harshness in the way he ruled and reigned over Ghana and a lot of um, regimes tend to be authoritarian, authoritarian just because to keep a sense of stability and to, you know, also not endanger what has been achieved through the struggle. So it's always these two sides. And when I when I was visiting Ethiopia, I was there um, coming like on a layover. So I, 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 you know, I wanted to get an insight into the society. And it's like exactly what you said that people like on the outside, it's like we were never colonized and it's this really proud feeling, you know, to have a different architecture. I mean, it looks different from any other African country just because you have, you don't really have European influences, but then on the other hand, people hush and don't want to talk about the conflicts internally because they're afraid to be persecuted. And so it really left me like conflicted in a sense. And yeah, what like what would be your take on this? Or is Ethiopia something you can you can take as an example to look at other African countries, or is that absolutely not possible? That would be my field of interest, just more the yeah, away from this conceptual, like what happened in Africa and how can we conceptualize that what actually yeah how the movement enacted itself sure so i think that the fact that ethiopia was never formally colonized actually has been a problem for thinking about um the ways in which uh colonialism still shaped ethiopian reality right um, so certainly the, you know, when, you know, Europe showed up in Africa, um, and started to formally annex, um, different ter territories, um, you have a process through which a number of leaders in the Horn of Africa, you know, are aware of this process that is happening and actually engage it, um, in terms of, well, if European leaders are going to, you know, you know, enclose territory and claim sovereignty over over some land. We, well, we're going to do that too, right? So I, I think perhaps in the context of the Horn of Africa, sovereignty um, meant that borders were much more overlapping. People people move, you know, back and forth. There wasn't a sense of just like one people, one territory, one religion. But it it seems to me that once European imperialism is shaping African realities that becomes the language through which um, African leaders are also engaging their populations as well, right? And I don't think that they have much of a choice in a way, um, or maybe they did actually, let me, let me rephrase that. They probably did have uh, more of a ch choice, but it seems to me that they do adopt that kind of language, right? And I think this starts happening quite early um, in the Horn of Africa, you have, you know, you know kind of the, the processes that are happening in Egypt, um, through Muhammad Ali and the Ottomans, you know, um, from the early 19th century onward. Uh, not yet. Huh? Hello? Oh, somebody just turned on their mic. Okay. And Alfonso? Maybe you can turn off the mic. Alfonso? Turn on. We can hear you. Maybe you can turn off the mic. Oh, hold on, please. Thanks. Uh, I am not very good at this. Uh, <laughs> are you able to listen? No. It's in the lower left corner. There's like a t little microphone icon. 
I'm just in a new. Yes, perfect. Um, so I see he has a question there and I will answer it in just a second. But um, <laughs> uh, so, so anyway, this language of sovereignty and the nation state becomes a language that is adopted by African leaders. And I think sovereignty meant something very different in, in a kind of you know, pre-colonial period. So uh, Ethiopia wasn't formally colonized, but certainly the institutions um, that get adopted from the late 19th century onwards are, are European institutions, right? Um, and that starts to reshape Africa, you know, the reality on the ground there. Um, you know, the question of authoritarianism uh, is interesting. I, I think one of the things that we do need to, to, to think about is the ways in which, yes, the state is um, authoritarian, but I also think that um, the various opposition groups in various African countries are also authoritarian. Um, <laughs> and so we, we can't just think about opposition groups as you know, resisting an authoritarian regime. Like what is the authoritarianism that is shaping their response to, to a particular um, government, right? Um, and I think that's part of the, the reality in Ethiopia, right? You don't necessarily have multiple democratic movements. Maybe what you have is multiple authoritarian groups vying for power, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think a big problem in that sense is also like a very strong sense of patriarchy or I mean of like yeah I mean power struggles that is like maybe human nature I don't like it's not Africa specific it's right. like wherever there's a vacuum it, it people try to push and fill it with power or claim power and assert power and continue power so in that sense, it's just repeating something that has been already showcased all over the world. So uh, I agree with you on that. Um, that yeah, although I, would, I wouldn't want to necessarily reduce it to human nature because I do think that um, the fact that um, the nation state attempts to homogenize geography and it attempts to homogenize um, space um, does produce a kind of result where um, it, it seems that you can only, the only thing to do is claim the state as your own, right? So there's a way in which the nation state itself as a form is unable to accommodate difference. Um, and I think that, you know, creates its own set of problems as well. I, I wouldn't reduce it to, to uh, nature as such, right? Um, but what is the problem of, of Somebody's mic is on again. Um, very odd. <laughs> Sorry, it's very distracting. Um, Modu? Modupela? Can you turn yes. your mic off? Your mic is on. Uh, thank you. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, no problem. <laughs> um, what was I saying? Yeah, the, yeah, I wouldn't reduce these things to uh, the nation state. Um, I also think like in the wake of the failure of decolonization, um, you know, what has happened is not um, a kind of um, robust type of critical theory, um, but maybe um, a set of conspiracy theories attached to like attempts to like grab power, grab, you know, grab power just at the level of the state. And I would, I, I think that's actually what's happening in, in, in Africa right now, right? It's like, if you go to Ethiopia, if you go to Kenya, you go to, to Senegal, I think you have um, na like the nation state narrative has completely fragmented, right? And I think people are now mobilizing kind of ethno-nationalist narratives in order to think about who they are in the world. And I think in relationship to those ethno-nationalist identities and narratives is a, is a set of kind of conspiracy th theories that get attached to that. And that becomes the mode through which then people, um, you know, engage with each other. So that seems to be like our present moment. But I don't think that's just Africa. I think like that kind of um, way in which 
you know, the nation state and anti-colonial nationalism has fragmented and led to a certain kind of sectarianism has meant that, um, you know, every sort of communal identity now has its own story that it's telling itself. And then it has a set of, yeah, like conspiracy theories that it mm-hmm. throws at, at the other group who is the problem, right? I think that's true perhaps mm-hmm. in Lebanon or Syria or, you know, Ethiopia or Ghana as much as anywhere else. Mm-hmm. I have a last comment, if I I feel may. like I'm all over the place when I'm talking here. <laughs> this one last, because, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. yeah, because I mean, I wanted to just ask, have you also looked at the internal political systems? Because like when you look at Ghana, for example, it's a centralized state. That's how it's organized in contrast to Nigeria, who is um, decentralized in the sense that they give regions autonomy to decide over, you know, certain things. And that might, um, you know, yeah. like prevent conflicts to, 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 um, to even start destabilizing the state or the, you know, the livelihood of the people and such. Do you think there is a connection with that maybe as well? Or is that just- yeah, so- so one of the things that I argue both in my book and, and elsewhere is that the way in which the African state gets sort of talked about and resisted and then reformed is, is, is flip-flopping between centralization and decentralization, but they tend to be kind of opposites of the same process. So, you know, we have the problem of you know, fragmented ethno-nationalism or fragmented, you know, communal identity. So what we need is a strong, you know, state that is going to um, bring, you know, bring unity to the country, right? And in fact, that's the narrative that you hear in Ethiopia these days. It's like the the kind of federal system was a problem because the federal system devolved power to the regions and and then, um, you know, land and resources were then generated through um, regional identities and communal identities. And that became a problem because if you were a minority in those regions, then how did you access um, resources, right? So there, there's a kind of resistance to that process of decentralization because it actually ends up fixing uh, you know, ethnic identities, right? And so then there's like a flip-flop back to this, oh, we don't want, you know, ethno-national identities or regional identities. We want like a, a strong centralized state, right? But it's actually like the same process of, that is, you know, pushing people towards centralization as much as it's pushing people towards decentralization. Um, and in fact, what is never really being addressed is the ways in which ethnic identity has been um, become something that is quite static or the ways in which um, it becomes um, an avenue through which resources are generated. On the other hand, uh, when we move towards centralization, we then get this like modern language of modernization and we doing away with those back those backwards sort of communal identities. Uh, but we're not actually really dealing with the the overall reality that creates this need to go back and forth all the time, right? So, you know, Nigeria becomes one model, you know, and then Ghana becomes the other model, right? And that, but it's not actually really addressing the, the social and political processes that lead to both of them as, as a solution, right? So, um, and a solution with limits, yeah. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> I hope I'm Thank making you. <laughs> right. Alfonso, did you have a question? Did you, you were saying something when you turned your mic off. So don't you have, would have to turn it back on. Turn it back on right now. We can't hear you. Uh, I actually had sent uh, a question, uh, but I will elaborate on that. Uh, And bear with me. I tend to to fly around. I've been around this uh, gray hair. <laughs> I was trying to uh, bring uh, an old uh, perspective on the role of uh, Haile Selassie, the lion of Judah, uh, and how I used to, uh, when growing up, um, 
being a world affairs uh, news freak, uh, I, I I actually related him with to uh, Reza Pahlavi, the other emperor of the right. uh, not, not that far, because both of them were um, became uh, uh, U.S. Uh, 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 Assets or the West, but basically the two Anglo nations, uh, and more in the case of, of Iran uh, uh, in, in, in Ethiopia. I think that the Brits tried to do something, but uh, they uh, when they uh, when they uh, colonized or invaded uh, Kenya, but uh, uh, they would basically uh, leave Ethiopia. To the, to the Italians, maybe correct me, but, but then, so in a way, uh, and it's not the only case, of course, uh, so, uh, a, a, a liberator, uh, 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 independence hero uh, turns into a, I don't know how much of a puppet he was, uh, 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 Selassie, uh, uh, Reza Pahlavi, well, we know this story, but the, the, the other funky thing is that how the, the, the two assets uh, turn into liabilities, uh, 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 at least for 15 years in, in Ethiopia, they switch back because NGs to, to, to Marianne, uh, According to my li very limited knowledge, uh, turned to a, a little monster. Well, you remember he came to power when he was practically a teenager, <laughs> or not? Uh, and uh, as for Iran, well, it hasn't been reversed. They are still there, a, a defiant country, and uh, Ethiopia went back to it. To the fold, I, that's my interpretation. What do you think? We went back to what? To the fold, to the U.S. Uh, system fold uh, base. I mean, uh, Meles Senawe uh, was regarded highly in, in, in the war at the World Bank quarters. I, I remember having read the glaring, uh, I mean, very positive reviews by 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 a guy whom I respect a lot. I'm an economist. Uh, Joe Stiglitz, in one in one book and one or in several talks that I actually, uh, one of them I was present. Uh, he praised uh, Meles Senawe as, as as the role model of of a, of, a, of a, but, but but my point is sorry I talk a talk uh, the. Uh, uh, the, the what's to the point uh, was uh, Haile Selassie. Do you think that Haile Selassie was? Uh, I don't know. He was listed in Philip Saji's uh, book, uh, the company, uh, but uh, I don't remember exactly. I mean, it's been a long time, hasn't it? <laughs> have you heard, you have heard about that book, or or are you even uh, dig into that book? It was a. Uh, it turned out to be a who is who of. of uh, uh, see uh, assets in, throughout the world. I, I, I don't know if uh, Haile Selassie was listed there. Thank right. you for your patience. <laughs> uh, sure, no problem. Um, so, huh? I'm not sure. So I would I would connect uh, Haile Selassie to um, to the Shah for sure, right? I think they're very similar. I think you know the Shah. Uh, claim to to run a, mar a monarchy that was like I don't know six thousand years old, and Haile Selassie claimed to have a monarchy that was three thousand years old, and that he could trace his ancestry to to Solomon um, in the Bible and all of that, and they would create these like you know genealogical charts that would show that kind of thing. So there was a sense of um, the regime in Ethiopia as very ancient. Um, and as if there was continuity of the state from, you know, you know, um, from Aksum, the Aksumite Empire. The Aksumite Empire was an empire that existed in the Horn of Africa, you know, from 
the around the time just before Christ until the sixth century. Um, so there was a sense that there was continuity of, of that empire right straight through to Haile Selassie. And there was a claim about civilization that was being made by Haile Selassie as well. And I think that claim of civilization is really interesting to think about in terms of decolonial theory, because it was a claim to civilization that was like, we're even better than Europe, you know, in, in many ways, right? We have a longer history, um, you know, um, but it never questioned the categories that were being mobilized to, to posit Ethiopia um, as better than Europe, which and those categories were like things like civilization, which are, I think, you know, quite, those, they're, they're very European categories, right? So I think what's interesting about Ethiopia and Haile Selassie is the way it is using a kind of anti-colonial uh, language, but the categories that in which that anti-colonialism is being used are still very European. Um, so that's one thing I, I want to say. Um, as for Melis Zanawi and the regime that came into power after 1991, I mean, part of what I argue in my book is that Melis is actually a product of the student movement of the 60s and 70s. I mean, he was a student during that time. He was an activist in the 60s and 70s. He went into the bush to resist the uh, communist regime that came um, into power after 1974, except he was also a Marxist as well, right? And so that's really interesting is the ways in which you have very, uh, different Marxist groups in Ethiopia having arguments with each other about the nature of the state and what the solution was. And certainly with Melis, the idea was that one should take the nationalities question much more seriously rather than simply having you know this kind of unifying top-down state you know again the problem of like is centralization the the solution or is regional autonomy the solution right so um and i look so i'm i i locate the 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 the, the post 1991 regime within that student movement still and trying to answer the questions posed by the student movement of the 60s and 70s one thing I just want to say a little bit about method then is that I am very much interested in um, the social life of theory, right? Um, so I'm really interested in the ways the student movement is generating theory in the 1960s and 70s, how they come to articulate the questions that they pose, um, and not necessarily seeing them simply as uh, Marxist who are adopting a language that belongs to Europe, but certainly there's a situation that they understand themselves to be a part of. They're looking around the world in order to, to find a way to articulate questions and answers to their situation. Um, and I think what the student movement in Ethiopia teaches us is that there is a kind of back and forth and multi-directional movement of theory um, that is happening between Ethiopia, Beirut, the United States, Cairo, Moscow, et cetera. And so rather than think about Ethiopian Marxists as adopting some kind of Euro Eurocentric theory, what is more interesting to me is how all of this multi-directional theory then plays out in a particular kind of place, right? It, how it plays out in Ethiopia, right? Um, so I don't want to think of uh, Ethiopian Marxists as self orientalizing I don't want to think of them, I don't also don't want to think about imperialism as simply something that arrives in, in, in Ethiopia and then everybody has to be like, ah, imperialism, it's, you know, uh, you know, something that I either resist or um, I am co opted by I think what is much more interesting is the ways in which people are attempting to, again, pose questions and answers about their situation. And I don't think that this idea of seeing um, imperialism as simply one type of force that, you know, um, shapes reality um, is, is uh, useful, right? I don't, think, I don't think imperialism is just a homogenizing force, in fact, right? I think imperialism has, is fragmented too and doesn't always know what it's doing. And what's interesting is the ways in which um, Ethiopian students in the 60s and 70s are um, able to navigate um, what is um, 
a bumpy road and, and not a straightforward road, um, if that makes sense to people. I, I think Amy had her hand up a long time ago, but now she's put her camera off. So uh, I don't know if she's coming back. Amy, are you there? All right. She's probably, <laughs> she's probably gonna be back in a minute. Um, um, if anyone else wants, if not, I would um, ask you a little bit more about Marxism because you were already talking about it. Sure. I thought it was really um, interesting, interesting to see your take um on this and like include like in, like the way you deal with like including all these theories like also the frankfurt uh, school the critical theory neo-marxism and then um my question is basically like how do you deal with this um you know problem of having to include them or wanting to include some of their thoughts but also um like providing a decolonial reading of of these people for the african context or like i don't know like what do you say what you're doing is like some sort of a neo neo marxism or is it like african marxism do you like do, would you want to frame it that way or would you be like no it's like it has to be it's consider something international somehow in this because you have this one if i may quote you <laughs> you have this one um um sentence where you say um this is on page 195 if people want to follow me african systems of thought cannot be made explicit within the framework of their own rationality which is to say that even as africans attempt to decolonize knowledge systems they remain caught in the trap of legitimizing legitimizing themselves within the protocols of the colonial knowledge system. So in your case, it doesn't feel like a legit legitimization at all. Yeah, and I wanted to ask like how you would, you know, like how, 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 you, how do you deal with this? How do you posit yourself like within the context or like as, yeah, within this discourse? Yeah, so I think that one of the things that I really do in my book is I try to not, whew, I'm certainly, again, there's no kind of a priori judgment on what is the relationship between theory and practice in some ways. Um, and I'm much more like interested in thinking about the student movement in Ethiopia as a particular project that poses questions. And so I'm just like, what is the situation that they're in? How do they pose their questions? What does that teach us about? Um... Así es que hace 45. <laughs> Perdón, Alfonso, usted tiene que apagar la, el micrófono otra vez. Gracias. All right. Um, yeah, what does that teach us about, about Marxism? Um, and I think one thing that's really interesting is that they are, they never approach Marxism as something that is outside of the world in which they live in. Like, they're not like, oh, this is a European discourse. They're less like Marxism is about, helps us think about capitalism and it helps us think about colonialism. Um, we find our, th those are the two sort of dominant forces that are shaping our reality. Um, so they go to Marxism to, um, to, to, to think about their situation, but they're also making Marxism have new meaning because of the ways in which they adopt, um, you know, it's, it's text and so on. Right. And so one of the things I, I want to, to posit is that they, Mar Marxism isn't, doesn't have a center necessarily. And, and that when Ethiopians reinterpret Marxism and make it make sense to their reality and, and allows them to develop, you know, politics and policies, um, we need to take that seriously as part of a Marxist tradition as well, rather than seeing Marxism simply as, you know, emanating from Europe to another place, right? So I think that's a big argument in my book. Um, but I suppose one of the other things that I am arguing about, and I think this is like perhaps more subtle in the book, is that there's there's an argument about my body um, in the book. Um, and this is where the Tizita stuff also becomes important. But I also am thinking about, you know, who is Eleni, who is the San team, 
thinking about these students, right? Um, and um, I have a relationship to these students because I'm part of a history. And um, I'm also, I guess, trying to think about that relationality as well. Um, and I actually turned to um, the, the idea of, um, I guess, species being in, in Marx um, as a way to think about the body as, as having a history, as having an inheritance, um, that the body isn't just something that belongs to the individual, um, that it's shaped by history, um, that it is a set of relationships as well. Um, and so if I end up rescuing Marxism in a way, <laughs> it's because it allows me to think about that relationality um, and that relationality as being embedded within um, capitalism. And I want to maintain, um, I don't want to just talk about relationality and in, in sort of like some kind of romantic way. I, I really want to talk about the, the kinds of social and material processes that are shaping um, relationality. And I think Marxism then gives me that language. So I end up rescuing Marxism um, um, because it becomes the only sort of critical language in a way to, to even think about the problems of Marxism in Ethiopia, <laughs> strangely enough, yeah. Um, I, I, Ami, you had your hand up as well. Uh, Katerina, I, I don't know if I answered your question. Sure. Uh, um, I, uh, my question actually relates to this part of the discussion about the, the tension between you know, the universal and the particular or the theory and practice. And I'm coming from literary studies. And one thing that I thought was really um, interesting about uh, the first chapter in your book and your talk on YouTube was um, the way you sort of explicitly address um, the narrativizing of this history and almost a, a literary way. This is as a very literary narration, you use the novels um, in that opening chapter to sort of deal with this problem of um, the co-presence of past, present, and future, which for literature is not a problem, right, as much because it's a different, um, a different discipline. And so when my question is more about um, Tizita, right, which is the, this locally grounded concept that you use as method for, you know, thinking and doing your social science. Um, and again, whereas in literature, that might not be a problem. I was wondering if you could just talk about your experience a bit um, in maybe using this as a, a bridge between those binary tensions that I was talking about? And are there disciplinary implications um, for doing something like that? Yeah. I mean, was it a risky move, I guess is what I'm asking? Or how, how did that work out? <laughs> I think it's a risky move. I think it's a risky move for sure. How did it work out? I think it's still like surprising for people. Um, I think the ways in which revolution is talked about these days is often through um, David Scott's work on um, revolution um, and his work on the Grenadian re revolution in particular. And he has this um, idea of problem space. And um, I think a lot of new work is really taking up this idea of problem space. So as if there's a generation that is posing a set of questions and we want to sort of pay attention to that generation as having questions. And we want to, you know, if we think about the answers of the Ethiopian student movement, the work of the historian then becomes, well, what is the questions that they posed or how did they, what is the context that generated those questions, right? Um, and I find that, you know, it, it's dividing past, present and, and future in, in, in really sharp ways. And I found that really problematic. Um, and I wanted to position myself as, um, you know, somebody who I'm, I'm engaging in this project around the, the, the student movement and the revolution because um, it's part of a, a living history and, and and that also the ways in which the past makes demands on us, the obligations of the past um, in the present isn't something that is just a kind of logical problem. 
um, that it is um, a problem of um, how the past uh, leaps up at us and grabs us and is uncanny and and all of those things. So that's really how I wanted to, but it, you know how I wanted to think about the past. But I think that's also important in terms of how I, I'm thinking about my body and relationality as well, right? So I am embedded in this history. The past is constantly like haunting me and and calling upon me to do things. And and I think you know that allows. Um, me to have a relationship of obligation to the past that's really different than somebody who is, you know, here is the problem space and here are the questions and answers. I mean, I find that overly, it becomes overly empiricist in some ways. Um, so uh, I really wanted to move away from that, that form of storytelling, I suppose, and, and really ground my method in terms of thinking about um, obligation as um, as a form of, uh, as, as part of the process of haunting, I suppose, rather than, yeah, that rather than like this, the top down theorist, I didn't want to be the top down theorist. I wanted to be problematic as well, right? As problematic as the students that I was looking at, right? And also then the question, I, I guess me as, as authors, I, I'm less, um, I'm, I'm less somebody who has uh, answers and more somebody who's trying to think with people. Yeah, and that was really important for the book. To, to, to do a different kind of social science is one where we're thinking with people. And I really wanted to maintain that as a writing style um, throughout, which makes the book a little bit weird, but so be it. <laughs> yeah. I liked it a lot. Okay, great, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. But that was really important to me is to not be that top down theorist, right? And I think as much as people talk about de decolonizing theory, that that position of the author is always maintained. And I really wanted to like struggle uh, with what it meant to challenge the position of the author as, you know, um, as expert, I suppose. Um, yeah, so. So that's, that's, that's how I, I, why I think I turned to Tizita as a concept, right? Um, because it, it allows me to deal with the difficulty of writing as well, right? And that the difficulty of writing is happening at, at like different valences, I suppose. Uh, I hope I'm making sense. Yeah, <laughs> totally. I also was reminded of what you said in the video um, that you said um, you wanted to pull out um, the universal from the particular mm -hmm. um, and like obviously in relation to your body and how you're sitting in the attic and like thinking about all these like haunting memories and melodies and everything um, and I was reminded when you said that I was totally reminded of what Erich Auerbach says about um, how we should write um, um, theory that we like always like look at something very specific and then unfold a bigger vision from that starting point and obviously we can't deny ourselves or like pretend we don't exist so i have another question <laughs> but um that actually relates to what you said before um about the relationality um like the non um romantic relationality to everything that um sounded li like something that i would say it sounds very um decolonial because it's like you know you could relate it to like all these like cosmological visions of how we exist in the world and that we're in relation with everything um but then you have this whole part about marx where you where you talk about the objectification of everything and how we like can only be subjects because we objectify so um in the in a decolonial worldview of i don't know the arawak which we were talking about and the context um, of Riveros de Castro, um, like it would be the opposite. Everything would be subjectified, you know, like we would like live in a world where, yeah, where we like try to subjectify everything and like imagine ourselves as the object in relation to the other thing. Like the plant looks at us, looks at us or the animal looks at us um, like as an object exactly like and, and like the other way around. So, so yeah, I wasn't sure, um, like, yeah, I would want to ask you how you, like, if you could maybe like elaborate a little bit on the, on the 
relationality and how you would how you refer to it and how you use it for your for your theory oh complicated complicated <laughs> subjectification is is that what is that the term that you used yeah so the plant looks at us the plant appropriates oh. us we don't appropriate the plant, but don't we do, are we doing both? As if the plant can look at us, it's also because we can look at the plant, no? I think in this, in the, well, in the text we read, it was mostly about animals and how like for, like the animal lives in a very similar mindset as a human being. And like, we all get reborn, like every cell gets reborn as um, a human being at some point, they all, used to be humans and we will all be pumas at some point or something you know right. so it's like also um this this whole like process and transformation of being and of thought and i think this is actually something that you also talk about um with like in relation to marx's theory that and the and the critical theory that you say um we have to like be aware of how our own thought is 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 an object of transformation of like historical of the historical context the way we think is always you know um influenced by in which time of history we live mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. yeah i don't know sorry like maybe this was a little far off but we were because we like like meet every second week we like have all these different readings and then i was reminded right. of that yeah no i mean i do think that I, uh, when I'm talking about relationality, I am obviously aware of other conversations about relationality that are happening in the world. And I think that um, I am suggesting something about relationality, although I'm not never like directly sort of, um, you know, quoting some of the, the folks that you are um, referring to now. Um, but I wanted to, posit that there was, I mean, I guess Marxism and, and Frank, the Franklin School, to me, it's like, you know, that, 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 that thread of, of critical theory is, a, is, is a theory mostly about relationality and historical transformation, and that, that sort of back and forth between subject and object, and the ways in which something is always, if it's going to be a subject, it also has to be an object. Um, so it's never one or the other, um, but de depending on perspective, it might be the object at one point and then it might be the subject at another point. So um, I really wanted to sort of think about that, but I also wanted to, I guess for me, it's, it's also really important to think about violence and violence as relationality um, and the ways in which re relationality isn't just about um, togetherness, like it, it's our it's sort of our capacity for for relationality that allows for violence to also exist too, right? Um, and uh, the fact that I I can be taken by another, right? <laughs> um, the you know the I guess the corruption of of that sort of dialectical process, or the you know, or the the corruption of love, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, so I, I guess I was also trying to think about that too, right? Um, and, and I actually think my book is, is actually a meditation on social violence, right? But I never really talk about the violence as such, because I think the revolution in Ethiopia was really, really violent, right? Um, and the, the processes subsequent to the revolution were also quite violent, but I'm also trying to think about ideas, um, in relationship to practice and, and how those ideas get transformed into practice, but also, um, yeah, like, you know, what constitutes my relationship to this revolution isn't just one of uh, relationality that is a good thing. It's also one that is destructive and, and, and violent, but it's not because I'm outside of a historical process. It's it's precisely that relationality that allows for that violence. So, so that's a, an important thing. I don't want to romantic. It's like really important for me not to just romanticize relationality, right? Um, does that make sense? Yeah.
Any other questions? Lynn, you got some questions for us? We can't hear you, your mic is off. No, this interests me very much, but I, I, I came without having read, so I'm listening right now. Oh, right. Um, I'm okay. coming from comparative literature. Um, I've done a lot more work in West Africa, Latin America, and India. Right. And um, no, I, I'm interested in the, uh, the, the, the problems when uh, imperial structures are, are recreated in colonial spaces, and those include Haiti and Mexico and in, in Latin America. Uh, I see that I'm interested, very interested in um, some of what you've said about theory um, and the question that was put earlier about whether you see some of the ways in which you're working with Marxism as relevant to other colonial settings. I suppose that's a, a question I could actually ask. And um, I will look forward to listening and participating more in the future. So thank you very much. Great, great. thank you for coming. Uh, do you want to react to that, Santim? Lynn, I'm so glad you found us. This, you, it sounds amazing what you work on. I'm, um, I'm too. I'm it works very well. well. Thank you. I'll write you a note. Thank you, Katerina. Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, Marxism as it relates to other contexts is, you know, I, I guess part of the intervention of the work is to is to think about, again, as I was saying, Marxism, not just as a kind of Eurocentric um, theoretical tool, but the ways in which uh, these students are, I don't even, now I'm like even not sure I should be using the word appropriating Marxism because I think they're, they're doing something more than just appropriating, but they're, they're certainly making Marxism their own and, um, so the, the Marxist tradition, you know, is as much as e Ethiopian as it is German or, or European in, in my rendering of, of the term. Um, but also, I, I think I, I am really interested in the ways in which Marxism thinks relationality. I think it's a really important tool for, um, I guess, our contemporary moment. Um, and I think there's something really useful about um, both, both Marx and, and, and how he's thinking about it, about relationality, but also in particular, um, how the Frankfurt School is concerned with that question as well, right? And I think, you know, Adorno's essay, Subject and Object, um, Horkheimer's essay uh, on critical theory and metaphysics is, those are really important essays for me in terms of how I'm trying to um, rethink the relevancy of um, Marxism for our, for our period, or, or maybe if we think a, a Marxism for a, for a decolonial uh, uh, period as well. I think, I think the Frankfurt School has been really overlooked as a tool um, that can help us think about a decolonial Marxism. Um, and when I, when I say Frankfurt School, I'm thinking of early Frankfurt School, not so much the later Frankfurt School. So I'm thinking Adorno and Horkheim's work, but also um, Benjamin and, and, and Marcuse. That, that's primarily who I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. But also the, because they're really concerned about the relationship between psyche, body, politics, and economy, right? Like I and. And my, my book is like a Frankfurt School book. Like I, I think like my whole writing method and um, even the way that it's like fragmented to some degree, the book, I'm not necessarily doing a linear chronology of the revolution um, is very much, um, a, you know, an ode to the ways in which the Frankfurt School writes. Um, and I would say like the Frankfurt School for me was like reading like, you know, I will read, um, the, what's it like self-help literature Frankfurt school is like my form of self-help literature like that's that's really how I relate to it um, um so and I think one of the things that's important for the Frankfurt school and I think it relates to a question Katarina that you had asked earlier is that you constantly have to come up with new methods given um you know the particular historical circumstances that you're in and I think Tizita 
is me like again struggling to find a method for my particular sort of historical circumstances so i'm not sure that it is it, it you know tis it as a kind of you know sociological concept that can just be appropriated from my work and applied elsewhere right i think it has particular meaning for my my situation um and that means that um you know you know it's a reflection of my own struggle rather than than just a universal concept right and i, and I think the frankfurt school has really taught me that i need to, to constantly struggle with with method all the time um, rather than thinking that it's something that can be fixed so mm -hmm. yeah I, I love that you like the way you um, read uh, the Frankfurt School theorists as decolonial thinkers, basically, because obviously they have a lot of potential. Like they, like most of them have been kicked out of Germany and had to like have this whole refugee experience, etc. So and like also um, like one, I think one of the main, what like one central thought is um, when they talk of a pro word progress and backwardness that is always happening at the same time. So they're already questioning the linearity. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. Yeah. Like, and I think I, for me, like they're very aware of themselves as inside of Europe, but also outside of Europe. And that is like a really useful way for me to think about sort of like um, a decolonial program, and also that they're able to disaggregate the the European experience. It isn't just like one Europe, um, and I think that's really important for a decolonial project as well. Um, and uh, the idea of also um, writing in exile to some degree has, you know, also shaped my own, um, you know, way of approaching theory. Um, but also because so much of it is unsaid and it's performed like it's it's in the it's it's in the form of the writing itself right so they're not always um you know saying okay well here is a critique of europe or here i am inside and outside of europe or here i am writing as um you know a person who's in exile um rather the the form of the writing itself uh, reflects that that sort of positionality and i think that was also something important for me is like how does the form of of my writing um sorry there's there's a motor vehicle that's really loud here because i live in new york pardon me <laughs> and you know it's spring and the windows are open but yeah i guess the form of the writing was you know i'm i'm, I'm trying to push myself in, in that way as well so mm -hmm. Um, the other thing I was reminded of was um, the simultaneity, the simultaneity of times, you know, which is not only something they, the uh, the critical theorists say, I or I think Bloch says it at some point, um, but also or like Benjamin Benjamin with like uh, sedimented history, etc. Like how we have to like go into history and. And yeah, and like, see, it's something that we're doing with our body. Like, right. like research is something that we like, we have to, you know, touch earth right. <laughs> basically to, to deal with it. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I was reminded of that. And then, and then that is something that I, as a literature scholar and Lynn, you might probably add something to this as well, can, can relate to, because obviously in literature, we always have this this um effect that we're dealing with different times at the same time that we're like we can consider literature as you know a window into some other time but also as it also like yeah it just makes us um experience time differently in so many different ways so so i was delighted when you started when when you started your book with like two readings of novels like amy said unluckily she had to leave but but yeah i was so happy when she asked that question right yeah yeah and the simultaneity of time as a kind of um popular form uh that exists in ethiopia so the ways in which tizita is um, a, you know, it's a popular song form that is trying to capture the simultaneity of like multiple like times. I think it's really, or multiple temporalities, is really interesting that it, it exists at, at a popular form and it's part of 
um, kind of everyday consciousness, right? Um, and so how do we then think about that as um, a, a, a form of critique that already exists in Ethiopia, I suppose, right? Um, and I, be, I guess I'm interested in that in, in terms of the question of like democracy too, right? So if these things already exist as a form of critique in Ethiopia, how do we mobilize that as, as part of a critique of these knowledge, the kind of knowledge production that was produced by the students or by, by social scientists, right? And so I guess that's why, also why I um, wanted to perform my own writing in a different way. Like how, how can I um, adopt this Tizita form as my own form? And, and I think that's part of like um, some kind of impetus around the democratization of my own writing. If that, if that makes sense, right? Um, not that I'm simplifying my work, but, but that I am less, again, less an expert and somebody thinking with people um, among, along these multiple sort of temporalities, right? Um, so yeah, I think that was an important part of, of what I was doing in the book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, you're an expert in what we're trying to do with this group, basically, because we're trying to think together, you know, and like read together and everything. But also we have another expert. I just wanted to uh, mention this. Pujan is organizing, currently is co-organizing um, a conference on decoloniality in history at okay. Columbia University. So if you, if anyone wants to look into that, I'm, it's, it's amazing. They've like, they have all kinds of super interesting speakers um and it's huge so it's a very different format is it Puyan? Ah. yes ah. exactly it's uh yeah hi that's me um we've been or is it, um apologies for coming too late i had a different meeting and joined in a bit later but yeah we've been organizing a conference at the department of art history um on decoloniality and the politics of history and this is a great yeah i'm looking forward to um looking into your book and reading that. Thanks. Great. Great. Um, we have a little more time. I just would like probably like you can all always ask more questions um, in the last seven minutes that we have. But if not, I would um, ask my uh, my last question, I guess, um, which is about I mean, you've already mentioned it a little bit, Santim. Um, but you were you write about the bourgeois seeming institutions that um, function as neutral peacemakers, and then at the same time they do reproduce um, a form of power that draws out the difference that we have mentioned, so that formal democratic institutions become anti-democratic machines. This is a quote from from your book as well. And I wanted to ask you, how do institutions or how do we that we represent these, these institutions in the in the end. How do we avoid how do we avoid being anti-democratic or getting into this, you know? Right, right. I guess that was something that has something to do with the form of the writing that I was just talking about, that there, there's a way which I'm positioning myself very differently as a thinker, um, that I think is part of this project of sort of democratizing. Uh, knowledge production or, um, I mean, I think what, what one of the things that is really interesting for me is the ways in which um, the social sciences in Ethiopia ends up uh, becoming quite sort of partisan and, and um, you know, supporting one particular kind of political identity over another. Um, and, and, and I have a chapter in the book called Social Science is a Battlefield, right? In which literally I see the social sciences as playing a role in, in sort of uh, mediating sort of sectarian, uh, you know, politics. Um, and, and actually I think that it's able to do that precisely because it, um, it, it dons the cape of um, objectivity, right? So rather than saying who, who they are and, and how they're embedded in history and what their relationships are, it it's, you know, produces all of these categories that are supposedly scientific that can sort of describe reality 
um, rather than talking about how concepts are implicated already in history and Im implicated in politics, right? Um, and so in that sense, these kind of bourgeois institutions um, become tools of, of, of the, the battlefield. Um, but also there's an assumption, I think, that um, the social scientist is a kind of abstract you know, individual shorn of like their connections to sort of communal identities and, and again, history and politics and relationality so that um, that abstract individual somehow is talking to other abstract individuals, right? And that uh, we can have this kind of neutral knowledge production between abstract individuals, right? Um, but that's never, I mean, for one, maybe the abstract individual exists in New York or something, perhaps, maybe, I don't know, but it certainly doesn't exist in, um, in a place like Ethiopia, where, again, like ties to land and sort of communal identities and so on are so important, right? Um, and where capitalism certainly hasn't produced that separation of the economic from, from the political um, in perhaps the ways in which it has maybe tentatively in a place like New York. So it, maybe it is possible for abstract individuals to have a conversation here. It's just, I don't think that's the case anywhere else. And so these, <laughs> these institutions end up, these institutions that belong to these kind of abstracted individuals, I think are actually, because they can't acknowledge their embeddedness, end up becoming these anti-democratic machines, right? Um, in a very blind way. And I, and I think so much of the kind of so, social science knowledge production in Africa really resembles that kind of process, right? And, 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 and in a sense can be quite violent because of that, right? I would argue. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I actually don't think we, I don't think there's any like abstract individual that can, um, you know, be not embedded in, in where they are. Like, because even in New York or wherever we are, even in academia everywhere, we are embedded within the discourses and like the values we have always have to do with where we are. And like, I don't know, here in New York, obviously, I've um, like even the way we speak, even the way intonation works, et cetera, which again has to do with our body and musicality. Like right. it, it always plays a role. So, um, so yeah, thanks for pointing that out. I thought this was great. And also um, it's also, yeah, the musicality of the body maybe um, that brings us back to your um, main argument about Chisita. I, th I thought this was amazing and want to thank you so much. And be but before we end, I uh, want to um, announce the next meeting that we're having on uh, 1st of June um, in two weeks. That will be our session number 15 with Ana Ochoa uh, Gautier, another professor from Columbia University. She's going to also talk about decolonizing knowledge um, and the connection to music. Her book is called Orality, Listening and Knowledge in 19th Century Colombia. So it brings us, it also, it, it's it's like it's perfect actually because it will also um yeah reconnect us to this conversation i'm sure we'll have it very present in the next meeting because um it's also yeah it's also going to talk about knowledge and music right, right so all right well thank you guys so much for reading and engaging and hanging out with me um it was it was really fun so i hope it was useful for you guys as well <laughs> yes it was it was great really like thank you so much for like having all the patience and like um and i'm i'm sorry but like because people um came in and then left etc or had to go to other meetings but i think whatever they heard like whichever parts of the discussion they heard they've like taken something from it and also like i said i'll um, share the video with everybody and then they can listen to the rest of it so awesome. thank you so much Great. Thank you, guys. Take care. Enjoy the sunshine. <laughs> I, will, I will. It's so beautiful outside. I hope you guys enjoy it, too. Bye. Great. Bye.